deeply disturbed and destructive figure who risked his life and career for sex. I went round and um, he was lying on the sofa and uh, off of me. And I was sort of pouring this. Um, I said, oh, Frank, what do you want to talk about? And when I turned round, he was, he was lying on the sofa with his dick out, you know, playing with himself. And so uh, invited me to suck it for him. Uh, this is an invitation I declined. Um, I said, sorry, Frank, uh, let's just talk about the script, shall we? And uh, he uh, said, no, 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 you, should be, I sh you should be doing this, you're my writer. And I thought, like, you know, they didn't teach me this at writing school. Frankie Howard was one of Britain's favourite comedians. Provocative and naughty, he became a national institution playing the role of Lurkio, a voyeuristic servant who invited his audience to join him in the salacious world of ancient Rome. Excellent. Let's go and play something. <laughs> oh, look! Ooh. It's getting interesting now. Let's have a look, shall we? Come on, let's have a look. Come on, come have a look. That's it. Have a look, see what's going on. Don't rush, there's plenty of time. <laughs> oh, no, there isn't. Quick, hurry! <laughs> His comedy was always based on innuendo, and you knew that there was something slightly subversive, slightly naughty with Frank. Frankie's act was full of double entendres, and the audience would get the blame for having such dirty minds. He, he, he was in this bath, and, see, so, and he suddenly looked down, and he realised he'd got hold of something very important. <laughs> now listen. <laughs> it was staring up at him, and he looked... Listen. <laughs> But he wondered, he wondered if other people would be able to grasp it. <laughs> Frankie created a special relationship with his audiences, regularly teasing them with the prospect of revealing to them who he really was. But the thing is, this, you see, the BBC said to me, now look, Francis, you must have a new image. You must have a new image, you see. They said, you must show a part of yourself which has never been seen before. <laughs> shall we, Missy, shall we find out what part we're talking about first before you start gut pouring? No. <laughs> don't you go say you want to be a godsend, don't you go? He was the first comedian, really, to be a person rather than just a personality. You didn't go to him to laugh at jokes. You went to watch him. And that bond between him and the audience uh, transcended everything. Frankie's self-deprecating style appealed across the generations. In 1990, 50 years after he'd first started in comedy, Frankie addressed a group of students at the Oxford Union. He was 73, but he still handled his clever young audience with his usual brilliance, cutting them down to size with consummate wit. No, I'm not what you call brainy, uh, you know, a sort of clever clogs. I'm not that levels, O levels and A levels. Oh, no, 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 no. Because no. <laughs> you're all students. So naturally, to you, I'm not what you call an academic. By no way at all could you call me an intellectual. Yeah, yeah. And the... <laughs> Which is why I feel so much at home here tonight. To the public, Frankie was one of them. But in private, his life was far from ordinary. Behind the scenes, he abused his power and gave free reign to his shocking sexual compulsions. I was a researcher on a TV show. He'd been booked as a guest, and my job, one of many, was to look after him. So I was kind of bustling around, sent up by makeup, and gave him the knock on the door and said, Mr. Howard, they're ready for you in makeup. If, and at that moment, and we'd met briefly before, he kind of lunged at me, left hand straight towards the crotch area, and I backed off and said, Oh, well, we, uh, stuttered and stumbled my way out of the room. And don't think I'd given him any impression that I was either gay or bisexual or interested in him, and he knew we didn't have much time. It was as if he was kind of driven to make a move. Unless you knew him and you were there, you can't understand what a big star he was or what an aura that he put out. And therefore, people would be quite intimidated. He was someone who, because of who he was and his status in the business, I think had a lot of power, um, which he uh, used or abused. I've worked with people who were his dressers, people who worked with him on makeup, people who were floor managers, and I would say that 90% of the blokes, mainly the straightest seeming, slightly rough around the edges blokes, big hairy arse sparks and people, he would kind of proposition, either very directly by kind of approaching them from behind and rubbing their genital area or tweaking them or whatever, or by making really over the top innuendo about how he'd like to slip them a length or receive something similar from their good selves. If he'd done what he did to me now, I think he'd probably be arrested or, you know, I think, you know, I would just phone somebody up and say, you know, 
you either find it on the tabloid who are paying millions of pounds for you to grass up celebrities um, or you just phone the police. But even the prospect of arrest and exposure couldn't keep Frankie's compulsions in check. Frankie Howard just felt more and more trapped with his own addictions and with his own character flaws that he was an intelligent enough man to know that some of the things he did were wrong but he couldn't stop doing them. It was a compulsion that lasted a lifetime and threatened to destroy more than just his career. I said to him, Frank, unlock that door. Otherwise, I'm going to cut both your ears off. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it, have you? Isn't it outrageous? Frankie's greatest success was the TV series Up Pompeii. It got ratings of 12 million and was even made into a movie. We ought to mingle, you understand? Mingle? Ironically, its popularity rested on homosexual Frankie, starring as Lurkio, a red-blooded heterosexual. It was the 70s, homosexuality was legal, but the public preferred their stars straight. There's an old pair, if I ever saw one. I remember all those girls on it. It was so sexy. I remember, th you know, I remember thinking, my goodness me, it was a kind of real, real uh, adolescent sex fest for me in my mind. They had, you know, there was cleavage everywhere. A Pompey managed to involve Dad as well. I, know, I mean, it was nearly page three <laughs> of a television. You know, there were some gorgeous-looking uh, young ladies. And I think Frankie was very proud of it. Up Pompey was enormously helpful to him. Uh, one of the things I did, of course, was to put a lot of girls in the show. Um, he didn't like that at first, actually, but um, he began to realize that uh, the public was regarding him as a sort of a randy lad, uh, and that was good for his image, really, and it was. Knowing it was crucial to keep his sexuality hidden from the outside world, Frankie learned to live with gorgeous girls on set. But in his dressing room, he demanded something more masculine. I tried to have female assistants to go and tell him to get ready and that sort of thing, because, you know, he was, if, if a fellow knocked at the door and said, uh, five minutes, Mr. Howard, uh, he was liable to be dragged in. Inside the protected world of show business, Frankie's star status meant he could give free reign to his homosexual desires. During the making of the film, he targeted one of the dope-smoking young actors. Then. This guy went up to the dressing room to have the drink for breakfast, uh, commending him for his performance. And uh, he made his pounce, and the guy was stoned enough not really to be much worried. He told me later about what happened either way, so he just lay back while Frank went to work. And after it had been go going on without any sign of excitement, uh, Frank eventually sort of gave up panting and said, you won't tell anybody about this, will you? <laughs> Frankie didn't restrict himself to young actors in his dressing room. Any male juniors working around him were fair game. One young writer found out just how insatiable Frankie could be. He'd first sent some jokes to Frank, and he got an enthusiastic response to his letter, including these jokes, saying, come round and discuss them. So John, very excited, went uh, along and uh, Frank was sitting there in his, in his robe, and uh, he said he loved the, the jokes and he would like some more. Oh, oh, he suddenly got this twinge here. And uh, so he got some sort of ointment which should be rubbed in to get rid of the, of the twinge feeling. So he asked John then to uh, help um, by rubbing in the thing. So John, being a very innocent young man, got hold of the, of the ointment and started to and Frank kept saying, no, down, 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 till he finally gripped John's hand. John was horrified. Generally, he hit upon people when they were vulnerable and on their own. Uh, one newspaper reporter had told me that many years earlier, uh, Frank had put his hand down his trousers, and the only way that he could get him to get his hand out of his trousers was to bite him on the nose. And indeed, he drew blood with it. It's all about power. It's all about him being the powerful person and the subordinate being made to feel more powerless through the act. Frankie's propositioning them, they can do nothing about it. Frankie knew he was a big enough star to get what he desired. 
When he wanted to buy sex, show business helped him get it, and Fleet Street helped keep it quiet. It was the period where the rent boys were pouring in for the north of England. I think it started in the 60s and then in the 70s. And Frankie was into that scene there. I mean, at times, the light entertainment world had the pimps who would provide whatever they wanted. It wasn't difficult at all. And so when Frankie was disposed into that area, uh, he would uh, arrive at a little hotel in Paddington uh, near the station and, and uh, a young lad would arrive. It was all very discreet and no one would be ringing the press and uh, no one would ever get to hear about it. These were days when newspaper editors actually guarded great public figures like Frankie Howard. I don't think that would happen today. Most of his transactions with human beings were about power relationships and were an attempt to get them to boost his self-esteem with him in control, with him manipulating the interaction. And I think most of his, most of the interactions he engaged in were of that kind, deliberate, manipulative attempts to do something about what he felt was lacking inside him. Frankie grew up as a lonely, insecure boy in southeast London in the 1920s. From the earliest years, he found it hard to fit in. Howard grew up in a working class family. His father was rather distant and didn't really live with them that much. He was in the armed forces and he was living away most of the time. His mother, Edith, was the one who really became a kind of all-purpose parent. She had been brought up a strict Presbyterian by a Scottish father. And so religion was a very important part of his life. He tended to go off on long walks on his own, live in a fantasy world. He developed a stammer. One consequence for Frankie was a profound lack of self-esteem, which never left him. Growing up, he was desperate to find a way into show business, but it proved a highly damaging struggle. You have, in the early part of his career, an, an absolutely harrowing list of rejections that just everyone who appeared to have any sense of judgment kept telling him he was wasting his time and wasting their time. They told him he couldn't get into RADA. They told him he couldn't get into ENSA. They told him it, they, he couldn't get into stars in their battle dress. Every single time he went for an audition, he was knocked back. Every single time he asked for confirmation of his ability, he was rejected. It was only when he joined the army in 1940 that Frankie was finally taken seriously, doing stand-up for the troops in army canteens. The war, in a, in a perverse way, saved Frankie Howard, I think, because it, it, it gave him things that he'd been craving for so long in terms of a sense of camaraderie, a sense of belonging, and also a sense of approval that really the first time in the old canteens that they used to have where he got up and performed in front of his fellow servicemen and they laughed and they didn't just laugh but it was real belly laughs and applause that really made him for the first time think he was going to do it he was going to crack it and, and people could get what he was trying to do after the war he was quickly picked up by a producer who saw his talent despite his clumsy manner on the stage he was powerful because he was in control of the situation. Off stage, he was a shy, uh, almost bumbling sort of person who had very little respect from anybody. You know, I mean, uh, even I, as his producer, used to shout at him and say, for God's sake, Frankie, you know, don't pick your nose when you're bloody well delivering a line. Or, because, you know, he, he was completely unpredictable that way. I mean, he, he would say, oh, funny thing happened to me on the, uh, you know, I said, oh, for God, don't do that. Or, it, it, you know, he got his finger in his ear. Because he didn't have a technique. Really, all he had was a funny delivery and a funny face. He worked very, very hard at being uh, a grotesque comic. It looks spontaneous, but it's far from spontaneous. It's carefully calculated, it's rehearsed, it's designed to draw us in because he needed us in there. He needed showing one facet of his personality to a large audience and getting that affirmation back. 
Frankie's hard work paid off. His first big break was in 1946, when he appeared on the BBC's primetime radio show, Variety Bandbox. It got 25 million listeners and quickly made Frankie, aged just 29, one of the biggest stars in Britain. His whole act was built around playing with his audiences, pleading for their affections and then chiding them to keep their decorum. And before I could argue, cease. Before I could argue, cease. Be oh, you make me mad! <laughs> now pull yourselves together. Before I could argue... Oh. Frankie may have appeared to be sure of himself on stage, but in the wings he was petrified of facing the public. He had to be led on the stage. He was so nervous. They made it a part of the act, but it wasn't. He was so nervous he couldn't get to the microphone. And the compere of the show led him onto the stage and said, we've got a very um, 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 frightened young comedian we want to meet. And he went into his act from that moment, and, and he never looked back. And he was amazingly fresh and new. You could walk down streets in city after city and hear variety band box coming out of the windows and people gathered around listening. And so to perform there, as he did every fortnight, was really like every fortnight doing a Morecambe and Wise Christmas show. It had that sort of impact and that sort of sense of being special. With success came sex. But for the first 20 years of Frankie's career, it was a dangerous game. Being an active homosexual was illegal, but he still took huge risks with his fame and freedom. At that period, you know, thinking 40s, 50s and 60s, that period, it would have been a severe uh, threat uh, to his professional life. Uh, nobody at that stage could uh, uh, afford to uh, admit to being gay, I mean, apart from anything else, it was illegal. They'd have been, they could have been clapped in irons. Keeping Frankie's behavior quiet was an increasingly nerve-wracking job for his colleagues. In 1950, he was about to appear at the London Palladium when his producer got a phone call. The press rang up to say, right, we've got the story on Frankie Howard uh, having an affair with his boy. And you know, we're going to expose this, his homosexuality. If they had published that, Frankie would immediately have been arrested. Certainly, we couldn't have opened a Palladium with him. It was disaster. The thing is that they were in a business called show business, which was like a family. And within that framework, they could get away with almost anything. I said, well, the only one thing, I have to see if I can persuade this reporter to change his mind. So did a bit of research on him and found that he liked Beaujolais Village. And uh, so I invited him to lunch at the Savoy Grill. Frankie Hard got fame, and with fame came the attention and love of the audience. And with that came power, the power to manipulate all those around him, the control over all of the interactions he was engaging in. I don't know how many bottles we went through, but it certainly was more than three. And uh, I was able to stay able to walk to the taxi, which is more than he could do. <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't print it. Frankie's producers did everything they could to hide his homosexuality, but they couldn't protect him from himself. When they went out of show business and picked up what you might call rough trade is when they got into trouble. He did get muddled up with what, what I think is known as rough trade. And every now and again, he would have a relationship of some kind with uh, somebody who was pretty ruthless. And uh, he became subject, as I understood it, for quite a few times, uh, to blackmail. Blackmail for straightforwardly for money and blackmail threatening to go to the police, which could have been disastrous for his um, career. It was a, a common problem for performers who were homosexual during that point in time, that, that there was quite a, a racket going on in terms of, of threatening them with exposure unless they were paid. And so uh, he fell foul of that many, many times. By that time, we had 
come to live with the fact that he was homosexual. So it wasn't a surprise or anything. But I used to you know, say, for Christ's sake, you know, keep it down, mate. If you live on the edge, you can learn to interpret this buzz not as fear, but as a real euphoria. And here was someone who probably took really risky sex with the fear associated with it and turned it into kind of hypersex. Despite the dangers, Frankie couldn't contain his sexual cravings. In 1955, he was starring in Jumping for Joy, a film based around a dog track. On set, 38-year-old Frankie soon took a fancy to his 20-year-old stand-in. It was about um, half past four in the afternoon and I took Frankie's tea in like I did every day. And this particular day, all of a sudden, he got up and locks the door and drops his trousers and says something like, have a look at this. I said to him, Frank, unlock that door. Otherwise, I'm going to cut both your ears off. And when I pulled a shiv on Frankie Howard and threatened to cut him, he went mauve. And I said, Frank, I said, you're not going to look too clever this afternoon doing your close-ups with no ears. And, uh, oh, he went, oh. Shuffled to the door with his trousers around his ankle, unlocked it. And that was it. He bullied the people he worked with, younger people, his subordinates, to engage in acts with him. Now, he must have somehow persuaded himself that the probability of being kind of found out in any way that would harm him must have been fairly minimal. By all means, these people could report what happened, but the acts themselves so, sound so outrageous that people might think it couldn't have happened like that anyway. Despite his behaviour offset, Frankie continued working in films, making six movies in the 50s. But his dishevelled appearance and odd looks meant he was never going to be a leading man. He was a, a, an odd personality, especially for that era. Nowadays, when people are a bit grungy, it wouldn't have mattered so much. But at that time, being smart, clean and well turned out in society was very important. Frankie was the complete opposite. He never looked well dressed. He could have the most expensive suit in the world on and it would look like a rag bag. Because it's five to one, he'd have it buttoned up on the wrong button anyway. Frankie's box office appeal had been down to radio and the music halls. Suddenly, a new entertainment medium hit the masses in the mid 50s. Television was to change the world of show business forever. Frankie's act was out of fashion. The theatre in which he made his money, the music hall theatre, had, had gone. It no long, longer existed, and that he no longer had an act. He no longer had somewhere to play. He was completely out of it. Television had killed it, and with it, Frank's career. By 1960, work had dried up and his career was falling apart. Frankie's already fragile self-confidence was shattered. There were times when he was really hit rock bottom, when he sort of looked at himself and said, you know, let's face it, I can't speak, but my, my voice is, is not good. Uh, as an actor, he meant. Uh, my face, you know, I'm ugly. Uh, I wear a wig. What have I got? And if you took it that, he had nothing. He wasn't popular. You know, he wasn't... Uh, you, you look down the list of people who were available to guest shots and, and, uh, or, or to star into sketches and things. And he'd, he'd, he, he, he wasn't a, a name that came to mind immediately. He was, oh, well, he, he, he's yesterday's man. He came out and stayed with us at Wylam. And uh, that night, I mean, he was almost in tears. He said, you know, why am I not funny anymore? And I said, well, Frank, you, you're exactly the same. You, you know, you're doing the same act. You, you are the same. You, of course you're. So he said, but nobody wants to book me. Why is it that I can't get, you know, do, do I have to change my agent, my agent? Nobody wants to know me. I've asked. I said, but, you know, it's unfortunate, Frank, that, you know, you've been to the top, from the top, you can only go down. You've got to ride 
was ever calm. It took something out of him that, that was never replaced in terms of enthusiasm and, and uh, optimism and faith in, in the profession. He always expected it again, and there was a cynicism when it wasn't there as well. It wasn't just his professional life that was going wrong. Frankie's private life was also catching up on him. At a time when he needed work colleagues most, he found that many had tired of him and his off-stage behavior. When his popularity waned, there were quite a few people who didn't use him. The thing was that he gave value for money, but you had to accept his, the whole of Frankie Howard, his professional ability and his private life. And, that. and some people were not very good at doing that. It was during that period that a few people unquestionably would have said, no, I don't think so. And uh, I, I would presume that it might well have been that, um, uh, that the way he'd behaved before. Frankie was 43. His growing depression would soon lead him to take some very desperate measures. Howard's LSD sessions weren't anything as simple as just taking a little tablet and going off. They were weekend affairs. That Was the Week That Was was the most innovative comedy show on British television in the swinging 60s. When Frankie Howard was invited to appear on it in 1963, it was his first chance to make a comeback after a dramatic career slump that had left him out of work for the last four years. It seemed to me that Frankie had been unfashionable and off the screens for long enough that it would have a huge impact. Many people were probably seeing him uh, for the first time in about five years, and suddenly he was on this new, enormously popular, super chic, changing television breakthrough uh, program, and he seemed to fit in magically. Frankie was a star again. Show business welcomed him back on stage, and he soon became a member of the establishment, appearing on top shows like the Royal Variety Performance. No, I haven't had time to rehearse anything. I haven't had time, I'm just, I mean, you know, I haven't had a chance to get myself, I don't know whether I'm, I'm, I'm coming or going, I don't know where I am. I'm not even in the programme, I'm what is known as a secret. <laughs> When Frankie was invited to join the Carry On team in 1967, it looked as if his comeback was complete. Can I help you? Yes, as a matter of fact, you can. Tell me, this uh, work that you're talking about for us, this... Um, Meeting, yeah, yes. Not this... a particular. I can't do that sort of thing with every Tom, Dick and Harry. But you do not need to worry. There are no men in Aphrodisia, only women. Frankie was pleased to be back in the limelight, but he was never really comfortable in the showbiz set. It was good for business. He knew that it was good for his career. It was high profile. Um, they were big British movies. But also, I think he realized that because he wasn't in at the start, like the likes of the Kenneth Williams and the Sid Jameses, he wasn't really going to have the same clout. And uh, there were lots of egos within that group, as well as great friends. And I think he always felt something of an interloper. Despite feeling like an outsider, Frankie was more popular than ever. In big demand to appear on chat shows, he went to great lengths to avoid revealing anything about his private life. Would you like to, to lay bare the real Frankie Howard? I mean, what do you really like? This, we <laughs> this weather, you may, must be out of your mind. My God, it's too cold. What do you really like underneath? Pardon? What do you really like? <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> It's too cold tonight. No, I'm not there. What do you think? I, now, Michael, you know me a little bit, not very much. What do you think I'm like underneath? Well, you like, you like as a person. Now, well, you, you like most um, uh, funny men. You're you're serious, off stage. Oh. <laughs> and be careful what you say now. I shall sue you for no, every. You ask me. You ask me. Now, listen. If you're naughty, I shall sue you for every penny of that Australian fortune. Oh. Behind the diversionary tactics, one of Frankie's most closely guarded personal secrets was that for many years he had a live-in lover called Dennis, who he hid, even from friends. We'd always go around to the house in Edward Square, um, 
uh, for script meetings, and Dennis was always there. You know, Dennis was in charge of giving us drink. You know, or um, but Dennis was his manager, his business manager. And that's how he was described. Though he always seemed to be in the house with very nice bloke, Dennis. Very nice, very quiet man. Sometimes he was there as the cousin, sometimes he was there as a chauffeur, sometimes he was there as my business manager, and so on. He, he was always introduced in a slightly different way. Um, there may have been a purpose to this, I don't know, but this went on for a very long time before it was quite clear that Dennis was there because he was his lover, you know, it was as simple as that. While many people knew that Dennis was his lover, Frankie rarely let anyone catch a glimpse of the intimacy between them. When you saw them together, Dennis was as kind towards him and as loving towards him as any young man can be to somebody that young man loves. But Frank couldn't reciprocate. He never, ever was able to say, take his hand or, or say anything nice to him. He was unhappy with himself personally about a lot of things. I think about the way he looked, uh, about the fact that he, he wished he was probably uh, slightly more upper class, that he was more dignified, all these things, and of course, uh, within his own sexuality. And therefore, you're struggling with yourself all the time. And of course, it's going to cause all, all sorts of frictions within you. I once said that he had a face like a landslide of sadness. And he called me the next day when he read this, and he said, that's right, it is right, isn't it? I, I, I can never hide that. You know, when my face isn't doing anything in particular, it falls into this look of sadness. and. Uh, and in, in many ways, that's part of what I can't hide about myself. I'm a sad man. Do you think part of what I can't hide about myself is my homosexuality? No, it, it was always on his mind. Always on his mind. Growing up in a religious family, Frankie never discussed his homosexuality. He was devoted to his mother, who'd wanted him to become a clergyman. When she died in 1962, he was devastated. He had no one. The extraordinary thing about him in that period was that he had no one around him. Why would he phone a, a reporter? And uh, he came over to the house and stayed a few days with um, me and my wife. And at the end of that period, he said something quite extraordinary. He said, you know, now my mother's dead, I feel free. I, 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 I feel that I can, I can lead my own life and uh, all will be well. Um, but she taught me wonderful lessons and, and I, I will always abide by what she taught me. I said, well, what, Frankie? I mean, what, what did she teach you? He said, well, always to lead my own life. But I couldn't do it while she was around. Frankie had an overpowering love for his mother. But the point is, of course, that she never knew the real Frankie. She never knew about his homosexuality. It was never discussed openly. So I think that would put him in a little psychological dilemma, which is, my mother really loves me, but she doesn't know the real me. The death of his mother sent Frankie into a spiral of depression. He became so desperate in his search for self-acceptance that he even went as far as trying LSD therapy. Privately, it was something that was being tried by a number of people, including celebrities. Some were drawn into it because they'd heard some sorts of claims that it was somehow a cure for homosexuality. If he was taking it because of his homosexuality, and we have to remember that homosexuality was treated using a whole series of, of psychological and physical interventions at the time, it would have made him feel that this was such an enduring aspect of his character and personality as it was beyond change, even from radical experimental chemical treatments like LSD. Howard's LSD sessions weren't anything as simple as just taking a little tablet and going off. Um, they were weekend affairs, very intensive. Uh, he was taken there uh, by his friend and dropped there. He'd have LSD injected into him. Then a short period after that, he'd get a certain amount of Ritalin injected into him to get the right balance. And then he'd be left with a number of family photos, childhood mementos, and a pad and a pencil and he'd just associate and, and free associate and write and record his experiences and, and then assess them after and make sense of what were real, what were imaginary and what were fantastic. 
It was a drastic step to take, and it unlocked even more pain and confusion for Frankie. It was after these sessions that he, he began to talk more openly about his claims that his father had molested him sexually as a child, and, and also to pour out some of his feelings about his, to some extent, hatred of his father. And, and out of that is great um, fear and resentment at anyone in authority. He describes his father as a kind of gatecrasher. He resented his intrusion into family life. And you might even say that his competition and resentment of his father was part of the reason why he ends up in a position of wanting to embarrass straight heterosexual men. He wanted, in some sense, to have a power play with respect to normal heterosexual men to get his own back at his father. It was displaced aggression. Frankie had to make sure his personal problems remained hidden. His fans were from straight Middle England, and because of the intimate way he talked directly to them, they felt he was one of them. It was unique to Frankie, and he perfected it in the TV series Up Pompeii. But he used to do that thing, the prologue. He, used to do, he was straight to the camera, wasn't he? So we, as an audience, f from growing up, had a, a direct relationship with him. Greetings, citizens, greetings. The prologue. Now, today is a big public holiday in Pompeii, a big public holiday. It is the festival of the Vestal Virgins, or commonly known as VV Day. <laughs> now, please, now, please, don't mess it out. I don't know the tone of it already. Now. It helped him to form a kind of hybrid that, again, he broke the rules as he used to do so many times before. When it came to TV, he talked directly to the camera. Up Pompeii was Frankie's crowning moment. Only 14 episodes of the series were ever made, but its huge success was almost a trap for Frankie, who was now forever typecast as a gossipy Roman servant. Several years later, he tried to find a fresh vehicle for his comedy. In 1978, The Generation Game, one of the most popular family shows on television, was looking for a new host. Frankie desperately wanted the job. Shut that door. It's always useful for a performer to have something on television or on radio, you know, that carries their popularity on. And it is interesting to me that when Bruce Forsyth gave up the Generation Game and the BBC cast Larry Grayson to do it, Frankie was absolutely furious. Well, I'm cock a -hoo. <laughs> Do you know, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here on the, on the game. Because, you know, listen... <laughs> riff raff. No, I, you see, I've been thinking about this for weeks. He thought it was a, a, a made for him. And in truth, I, I can see why. Fortunately, it wasn't my decision either way, but um, uh, he would have done it very well. I'm too young to die. Obviously! Unable to escape his Roman past, in the 80s, Frankie was forced to trade on his earlier success. Wooed by ITV, he was given a series of pale up Pompeii imitations with rambling monologues. Freedom, freedom! Oh, don't take it away from me! Spare my life! Allow me to live my last years in peace! Peace and tranquility! Allow me where I am born! <laughs> There was a, a, an aspect of him that was quite bitter from uh, Pompeii onwards, really, in terms of what he did and its reception, that part of him was a businessman. He, he could see what worked. He could see what was good for his career and profile. And so he wasn't averse to going back to something, even if, in comedy terms, he didn't think it was still fresh. I think he was getting less satisfaction deep down because he couldn't really do what he did best. Frankie seemed washed up and past it. It looked as if his time in show business was coming to an end. But Frankie was about to make one more triumphant comeback and win over a whole new generation of fans. They actually sort of marveled at this strange monster that appeared before them, like King Kong, you know, breaking loose from the chains.
by the mid-1980s, after more than 40 years in show business, Frankie Howard had been pushed to the fringes of the comedy world. He could still find work, but to his new young colleagues, Frankie appeared to be past it, professionally and personally. When I first met him, he was really on a kind of downward slide about himself physically, about his appearance. He did seem to be making absolutely no effort. I saw him once in the West End of London, and it was lashing with rain. It was kind of October, November, and, you know, I waved at him. I just, just thought I was one of his fans, you know. But he didn't have even a raincoat with him or an umbrella or anything, and he was just walking, like, from nowhere to nowhere. Frankie was now in his mid-60s and was running out of energy. He'd been performing for almost half a century and was finding it harder and harder to keep going, both physically and mentally. He had to somehow battle against his nerves and insecurities. It became much more of a, a struggle and much more of a drain to keep doing it. And he did fall into the trap of just using various stimulants and, and things to relax him as well in order to get through the routine of, of performing and doing what he used to do as a young man. And so there were the drinks and there, there were the drugs and they became a more and more volatile cocktail in his body and in his preparation. And they became crutches, but also they made it worse in the long term. In 1981, Rory McGrath was working as a writer on a radio program called the Frankie Howard Variety Show. On the opening night, he saw firsthand how desperate Frankie's behavior had become. The show went really badly because I think Frankie had got the mixture of brandy and Valium wrong. He was quite, I wouldn't say incoherent, but I think he was actually out of touch with what the audience were feeling. You know, he was off on one, you might say. In fact, uh, I was standing next to a, another writer, a guy called Terry Ravenscroft, who, who was watching Frankie do the monologue, and uh, he, Terry turned to me and said, hey, it's a great shame, isn't it? You spend all that time working on a script and that <laughs> come and fucks it up, you know? <laughs> Which is great to hear about, you know, one of the Britain's best loved comedians, you know. But when you sort of accepted him as not a intellectual, you know, giant or, um, you know, a very, very important person, he was just a rather sad figure. It actually got much easier. As we got to know him um, and know his little ways, uh, it was quite a laugh, you know. We, it was our entertainment, you know. It was like, I am not quite like bear baiting, but if we were bored, we'd just say, let's go and let's ring Frankie up. It was a big joke, David Knoll was a very good writer. But we will say to Frankie, so you've had lo lo lots of writers, haven't you? you know, Bernard McKenna, you worked with him. David Nobbs, he says, oh, yeah, yeah. you're a big fan of Nobbs, aren't you, Frankie? Yeah, I like Nobbs. You know, he'd say it like that, he had no sense of humour, so this would go straight over his head, narrowly avoiding the terrible in the wig, of course. Despite the psychological and physical difficulties he was experiencing, Frankie was determined to keep performing. One of his last major successes was a show he gave in front of a group of Britain's brightest young students at the Oxford Union in November 1990. At the time when we shot Campus, Frankie was obviously an older man with a lot of health problems. His knee joints had started crumbling and he still managed to do 70 minutes on stage that night, which would put many a young comedian to shame. At the age of 73, Frankie had become a cult hero to a whole new generation of fans. He reveled in his iconic status and parodied his own reputation for corny catchphrases. Get into the comedy stuff now, all right? Okay. <coughs> Go. Oh, no! Oh, no, Mrs. <laughs> I'll do an encore. I don't usually do encores till the end. If I get to the end. Um, all right. No, not on your Nelly. You shut your face, you. Oh, titty in not, titty in not. Frankie was new to that generation, so to them it would have been quite bizarre, you know. They, they actually sort of marvelled at this strange monster that appeared before them, like King Kong, you know, breaking loose from the chains. At the end of that evening, I know that all of them were won over to him, without a doubt. They absolutely loved him. We went to the bar afterwards, and the buzz in that bar of the people who had just seen the show was enormous and very warm and affectionate towards him. 
For Frankie, the approval and affection he got from an audience was more than just confirmation that he could still make people laugh. One of the reasons he loved working and needed to work was the fact that he could be absorbed in it, that all of the other things went out the window, that when he was performing, at least, he could think obsessively about that, and he did think obsessively about it. And there simply wasn't the time or the room in his mind to worry about anything else or think about anything else. He was absolutely driven to achieve fame, but fame was never going to be a solution to his problems. It was only ever going to be a momentary distraction. You can't spend all of your life on stage, no matter how hard you try. But Frankie kept on trying. Desperate to avoid the emptiness off stage, he just wouldn't stop working. When he did a guest spot on Nicky Campbell's late night show on Radio One in 1990, he seemed grateful for the attention from his new wave of fans. He was superb on the radio, and the listeners responded to him magnificently. You can tell there was that just that ocean of warmth out there for Frankie, and you just get. But yes, it's you know, it's it's John in Middlesex. Hello, John. Oh. Oh, and people would come straight on into Frankiedom. Mike and Lyne, hello, Mike. Oh, no, missus. <laughs> oh, stop it, no, no. He's, 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 he's off now. Another caller, Jamie of uh, Chesham, is it? Nay, nay. Nay, uh, what? <laughs> the, no, don't laugh, say it without laughing. Thrice nay, nay, nay. Yes, nay, nay. nay, nay Thrice nay, nay and yea again I say nay. When he was performing, it was when he was alive and he was energised, and when it was over, kind of the atmosphere deadened and he there was a hollowness about him then and an, an emptiness and a loneliness I think that kind of took over him and then he wanted to talk and he wanted to drink and he wanted it to go on he, that's it he didn't want it to he wanted it to last forever he didn't want it to end a word a word now loved by a whole new generation, Frankie continued working right up to his death in 1992 appearing on cult programs like The Word for 50 years, Frankie had kept his public laughing with the same self-deprecating act. But none of them could have imagined what a dark and painful life he'd been leading behind the scenes. Ironically, it was this vulnerability that gave his comedy its unique and enduring appeal. I was just going to say, Francis, <laughs> you, you would never believe you know, you would never believed I, I trained in the same, the same gym as these, would you? But it's true, the same gym. Anyway, there you are. What are you waiting for, a tip? Next Saturday at 9, check out the 100 greatest sex scenes of all time here on 4. Next tonight, the story of another much-loved British comic who once sat on a multi-million pound nest egg, then lost the lot the rise and decline of Rod Hull and Emu.